Asteroid mining is going to be a trillion dollar business. Elon Musk and SpaceX might have the best chance to pull this off out of anybody. But is this actually possible? Well, let's find out. So today I've got Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today on the show. Welcome. Hey, Ivan. How's it going? Fantastic. What about yourself? Good. Uh, it's actually my birthday today. Well, so. happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, people in the comments, you know what to do. <laughs> So I was just wondering if we can talk about asteroid mining. I know this has been a hot topic. Um, and the reason for that is during the last conference call, Elon Musk was talking about nickel mm -hmm. and the conversation started about nickel and then it's progressing to don't asteroids have nickel? Can't we just mine asteroids? So yeah. I was wanting to get your thoughts on where are we at with asteroid mining? Is this a reality? Oh, or this is going to be you know, a world away. This is going to be the saddest podcast. It's going to be the saddest interview you've ever done from, <laughs> you know, like, don't get me wrong. I am one of the most starry eyed, future focused, excited SpaceX fanboys there are. But all of these ideas from asteroid mining to space power to all kinds of space utilization are really far away. And, and the reality is just, it's just ludicrously expensive to fly out to an asteroid and try to extract the resources and bring them back to earth. There is no financial incentive whatsoever in any way, shape or form to do that, that it will always for decades, hundreds of years, be more economical to harvest those kinds of resources, nickel, iron, gold, platinum, from here on Earth, even though there's an enormous amount in asteroids, they're in the asteroids and the asteroids are really far away. And it is just incredibly expensive and energy intensive to try to fly out to one of these asteroids and try to extract them. And in fact, there have been many companies that have tried to go down this path and they all go out of business. Literally the best way to go out of business in, in running a company is to try to go into the asteroid mining business. So we are well, a long, got, long way from that. Well, we've got Elon Musk who tried his best to go out of business starting a rocket company. Yeah, yeah. And a car company. So if there's one person that could potentially do it, well, he would be the number one choice. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the purpose of asteroid mining and just really resource acquisition in space is to support the economy in space. And so when you think about how we would want to try to bring some of these resources back to earth. It just doesn't make sense. Um, because, you know, uh, people talk about space power, right? The fact is, solar energy is just getting incredibly cheap, thanks to companies like uh, space to like Tesla, right, that you can get, uh, I think we're down to like under $2 for a per watt of power from a solar installation. So it's really cheap. But where these things matter is when you're trying to bootstrap an actual space economy from space. And so when you think about things like why everybody's so excited about searching for um, harvesting water from the south pole of the moon, well, we've got plenty of water here on Earth. And if we need water, we don't need to bring it from the moon. But if you're on the moon, and you need water, the best place to get it from is going to be on the moon. And the same thing, if you're out in space, you're already out at asteroids, and you need those kinds of resources, volatiles for your fuel, uh, gases to be able to breathe with, to be able to harvest some of these heavier metals, some of the regolith, things like that to construct um, structures, then you're going to want this stuff locally. And so the concept the sort of the catch all term for this is called in situ resource utilization. And this is the same idea that Elon Musk and SpaceX are planning with sending people to Mars is that they're going to build the fuel to return back to Earth from the atmosphere of Mars itself makes way more sense. You need the fuel on the surface of Mars, build it on the surface of Mars, use that to bring your spaceship back home. And so we won't see asteroid mining become a thing until the 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 
companies and organizations and missions that require the resources are already starting to happen. And then it'll make sense to bring those resources. And I'll just give you like, like imagine a base on the moon where you're going to, you're going to need to resupply your astronauts with fresh water, and you're going to need to have building material, then it makes sense to harvest that stuff from the moon. Let's imagine you're going to do something similar on an asteroid, then it makes sense to harvest that stuff from an asteroid. So all of those technologies, all of that industry, we're going to see that supporting itself, supporting each other. And we're not going to necessarily see the benefits of it all flowing back to Earth. Yep. And if you were to do asteroid mining, where are the asteroids located? Because I know you've got the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Yeah, there's like a whole Earth collection of, of asteroids which are called um, near Earth objects. And these are very important to scientists, to astronomers, and really to all humanity, because these are the asteroids that have our, you know, they have our name on them. They're the ones that that from time to time hit the Earth and do an enormous amount of damage, sometimes even uh, extinction level of events for vast amounts of life on Earth. So these are bad, they're very dangerous. And they are orbiting are all around us. Some are crossing the Earth's orbit, some are a little farther from the Earth. And what's really great about these near Earth objects is actually it requires very little change in velocity from the Earth's orbit to get out to one of these asteroids. You know, when you think about it, the Earth is already going at 30 kilometers per second around the sun. And one of these asteroids just requires a tiny amount of additional velocity from that 30 kilometers to be able to reach them. And in fact, less velocity to get to many of these asteroids than to get to the moon. So they're less energy intensive to get to an asteroid than it is to get to the moon. Um, so and what are the distances, if you were to compare to the moon, some of these near Earth asteroids, how would they compare? Like, would they be, you know, the same distance to the moon, 10 times the distance? No, they're farther. So they can be millions of kilometers away. So the moon is about four, about 400,000 kilometers. Um, while these asteroids can be millions of, of kilometers away. But but when you're thinking about space, it's not about the distance, because the distance is really just time, you know, you, you, you start your burn, you drift, without requiring any additional fuel, and then you arrive at your destination. And so the question is, how much fuel did you need? And for you to be able to get from Earth low Earth orbit to the moon requires uh, a, a certain amount of fuel, I forget the exact number, uh, the, the amount of like change in in kilometers. Yep. And how would you find out what the chemical composition of some of these asteroids are, because you wouldn't want to yeah. go to an asteroid and then find out there's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, astronomers use a, a term a technology called spectroscopy. And what they're able to do is essentially look at the light that is coming off of an object, and use that to reveal the chemicals that are in that surface, you know, you fly your scout mission to an asteroid, and it gets close enough that it can actually start to really resolve the features on the surface of the asteroid, it can be it can look at the reflected light of the sun and essentially figure out what chemicals are present on the surface of the asteroid. And from there, you can sort of map out where the good stuff is. Yep. So say you were to find an asteroid that's, you know, at a certain distance that you can sort of capture, I guess you'd have one of two options either to break off a chunk of this asteroid or bring the whole thing back. Yeah, well, I mean, definitely, as you are starting to mess with the trajectories of these asteroids, you want to remember how the dinosaurs felt about the movements of asteroids that, that, you know, an asteroid moved into the wrong direction is a very bad day for for planet Earth. And so you do need to be very careful. But but this idea of moving asteroids, I mean, still, it's not something that we've ever attempted. <clears throat> There's an upcoming mission uh, called DART which is a collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency. And one of the jobs of this mission is to slam an impactor into a, there's like a tiny um, asteroid moon that's going around the main asteroid that the, the mission is visiting, and they're going to slam an impactor into it and see how much of a change in its trajectory, in its orbit, going around the, the main asteroid it, it has. And <clears throat> this will 
this will tell them for the first time um, what it takes to try to change the trajectory of an asteroid. But but when you think about how energy intensive it is just to move spaceships around, which are very lightweight aluminum tin cans, you know, aluminum cans that are um, trying to move them around to be able to move the mass of an asteroid, which could be um, millions of tons, is a very energy intensive process. And there have been some ideas to be able to do this. Um, there are ways that you can use the asteroid itself as its own means of propulsion. So one idea is that you can, for example, shoot the asteroid with a very high powered laser, you that causes like a little piece of the asteroid to be uh, vaporized. And that causes a tiny little thrust to the asteroid. And maybe you can slowly over time, change the direction that the asteroid's going. The other idea is that you can use something called a mass driver. So you could put a mass driver onto the surface of the asteroid, accelerate chunks of the mm -hmm. asteroid off into space, maybe in a direction that you want them to go, like to your mining colony. And of course, thanks to Newton's uh, law, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, every blob of asteroid that you throw off the asteroid kicks the asteroid in the opposite direction. And so you can literally just have the asteroid, you can throw chunks of the asteroid off into space, and and use that to drive the asteroid where you want it to go. Um, there are additional ideas as you start to sort of think about the orbital mechanics of all of the objects involved, you can use asteroids to do very close gravitational slingshots of other asteroids. And by doing so change their orbits into things that are more useful. Uh, and so you could have a smaller comet or asteroid come from farther away, have to a very close slingshot of a larger asteroid, and that could change the orbit into something that's more useful for what we need. And so you kind of get these two benefits. On the one side, you are harvesting the resources off of these asteroids. And then on the other side, you are, you are shifting what are potentially dangerous asteroids into far safer trajectories. And so we could end up hundreds of years from now, having essentially defanged every single dangerous near Earth object and uh, enjoyed the profits, the sweet profits that come from from tearing them apart. So uh, there's lots of good reasons to do it. It's just like I cannot, again, un you know, understate just how far beyond our capabilities, today's capabilities, these kinds of of mega projects are for our current state, we can literally just barely keep human beings alive in space in near Earth that's, orbit. But you know, that's the beauty of science. I mean, you start off by talking about asteroid mining. And then as you start developing that technology, you, you then start to work out how you can potentially deflect other um, incoming asteroids that could potentially do us harm. Yeah. And Pretty much any sort of space mission the amount of spin-offs that have benefited society and spin-offs that people had no idea couldn't have even yeah. factored in when they did their initial program is you know remarkable yeah absolutely i mean the there are so many good reasons to just get started i mean uh there's a great company great group called the b612 foundation and and they have produced this plan called Space Guard, which is to launch a, a very um, a very sensitive telescope capable of detecting dangerous near Earth objects. And they've also proposed an idea to plant a beacon on an asteroid so that we can just like measure the position of an asteroid very carefully over long periods of time to just do a better job of tracking the positions of asteroids. And then this idea of trying different strategies for changing their 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 orbit, shoot them with a the laser, paint the black, see if changing the illumination that hits them causes something, put a mass driver on them, hit them with a nuke, um, you know, bonk into them with an airbag. I mean, there's a bunch of really great ideas to potentially move an asteroid. And right now, we don't even know which one is the one that's going to be most effective. Mm. No, definitely. And final question, what are your thoughts on Elon Musk and SpaceX? We have seen the first launch of star of the Starship prototype SN5, it flew to I think 150 meters 
successfully and landed again. Um, so we're expecting in the next couple of months to see larger and larger hops leading us to this dream of of this of Starship being able to go into an orbital mission. And if it can accomplish this, like if it can actually make it to orbit and return and have the top and bottom both be fully reusable, then it is a game changer the likes of which space exploration and just space flight has has never seen it is it is dropping of the costs of space flight by one maybe two orders of magnitude um i've seen like right now if you want to launch a kilogram into space you're looking at somewhere between three and ten thousand dollars per kilogram and i've seen mm -hmm. estimates for for a fully operational starship bring those costs down into the low hundreds you know, $100 per kilogram. So you're looking at two orders of, 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 uh, of magnitude drop there. And, and to be honest, you know, people ask me this question, like, what could we do? And the answer is, we don't know. Like, it, it's, it's so cheap, that it turns weird ideas into compelling ones. Um, mm -hmm. And so in the near term, we'll see literally every single mission that was going to go in any other launcher be shifted to Starship. And it's going to be hilarious because you're going to have this huge cavernous um, launch bay or the, you know, the, the launch fairing inside the Starship. And it's going to hold this tiny little satellite because it was still cheaper to put it on Starship than it was to put it um, you know, on, the, on its original rocket. And then we're going to see new missions designed with this incredibly um, inexpensive launch system in mind, stuff that never would have been possible. Because right now, when NASA and ESA and those guys, they, when they develop a mission, they set aside hundreds of millions of dollars for the launcher. Um, and then hundreds of millions of dollars for the mission. And so even right now, using something like Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, um, decreases the cost by like a factor of half. They get twice as much mission. But what if they get 10 times as much mission? I mean, we're just, we don't know what the future holds. And so I think in the medium term, we're just going to see uh, a lot of really interesting missions get get thrown up. And it will be the kind of capability that takes us into becoming this solar system spanning civilization. And it's going to be this kind of exponential growth curve as 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 mission after mission is launched into space. I still don't think that we will ever see the sweet, sweet profits from the asteroids come home, but we will be glad to know that they're being put to use really well in just supporting our growing solar system economy as the years and decades go on. Nice. And just as a just as a final part, can you just maybe tell us a bit about your channel? Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned in the beginning, I'm the publisher of Universe Today. So I've been doing this for about uh, 20 years now. Um, and that, that that's my main job is, is running the website. But I also do a YouTube channel where I answer questions from uh, people about all topics in space and astronomy. And I do a bunch of uh, episodes about different topics that I find really interesting. A lot of the kinds of things that we talk about here about about asteroid mining, about space based manufacturing, about really interesting innovations, but also things in cosmology and astrophysics and, and black holes and things like that. Um, and uh, so if you are into sort of what's happening in the near future of space exploration, uh, you probably will enjoy what I do. Oh, awesome. All right, Fraser. Well, thanks again for coming on the show, and I hope we can continue this discussion in the future. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'll let you know when uh, when Starship actually launches and returns to Earth. I'm sure you'll hear about it, though. Oh, definitely. Yeah. All right, thanks, Ivan. So I hope you guys enjoyed that chat, and thank you to all the Patreons that make these episodes possible. So till next time, I'll see you guys soon.